notice you slipped in a Jeffrey earlier this morning. Yeah, you did. We'll have a talk later. <laughs> <laughs> only Brett Reimer. He's the only guy who can call me Jeffrey in this church. But you might get into that club. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you for uh, the gift. Yeah, um, and we do feel uh, appreciated and um, all of that not just in October or whatever, but uh, if you're wondering if we ever feel appreciated or not, we definitely do, and so we're thankful for this church in lots of ways. Um, one announcement that uh, was, wasn't your fault, Todd, uh, didn't get mentioned, though, was the ladies' coffee house. They want sign-ups for today or in the next couple days so they can plan it. So if you're still thinking whether or not you should do it, do it. Um, that's it. I am a little bit recovering, and so sorry if I'm a bit sniffly this morning. We are uh, going to go back to Genesis. We've been away for a couple of weeks, and um, we're going to get back into the book of Genesis and, uh, and carry on till, till Advent, I guess. And so we are in Genesis 12 this week, um, looking at the story of Abraham. So there's going to be a few kind of story Sundays coming up, which uh, I think are good. So if you've been around for the last few Sundays, the last time we talked in Genesis, uh, it was the Tower of Babel story. There we are. Uh, and, and up to this point, up to Genesis 11, God has been dealing with humanity as a whole. So Adam and Eve, that's all of humanity. The flood, that was all of humanity. Tower of Babel, that's all of humanity. And then in chapter 12, it switches, and now God's going to reveal himself to one man and to one family. And he wants to show what he's like. This is against the backdrop of, of paganism, of all these gods who you don't ever know what these gods want. I wish you could know how to get what you want from these gods. And God says, I'm not going to be a god like that. I'm going to show you who I really am. And he's going to do it through, initially, one man. Which is crazy to think of the billions of Christians in this world. We all trace it back to one man and one family, and that's Abraham. And so we're going to look at his story this morning uh, as he begins kind of the story of God and his people. Um, the Tower of Babel, that was a story of moving east. From the Garden of Eden to the flood to the Tower of Babel, people were moving east, and they ended up in Babylon, the home of, the home of paganism, the home of worship of all these false gods. And now, uh, in Genesis 12, we start moving west. Abraham comes from this place called Ur. He lived up in the top there in Haran, and he's moving to the promised land that God's going to show him. So it's a, it's a westward uh, movement. And the story uh, picks up in chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, so he's Abram at first, he gets his name changed, uh, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So Abram is 75 years old at this time. And what happened in the first 75 years of his life? We don't know, and the Bible writers don't think it matters. Life starts for him at 75. Right, Leo? Life starts at 75. Life starts for him at 75. We don't know the backstory of what went on at this point, but when he's 75 years old, God shows up and says, I got a new place for you. Leave this country, and you're going to go to a new land. And God has no pictures, he can't Google it, he has no idea what it is, he simply has to trust if this is going to be good or not. He's going to leave his country. Some people in this room have left their country, but you can still go back. You can go back and visit, you can stay in touch. Some people in this room have left their people to come here. But again, you can email, you can text, you can go back and visit. For Abraham, there was, this was the final goodbye. He would never see that land again. He would never see his people again. And he left his father's household. That's his inheritance. That's all his financial security. Imagine if God said to you, I want you to go to Winnipeg this afternoon. Say goodbye to your family. You're never going to see them again. And when you get to the airport, I'll tell you which flight to get on. That's the equivalent of what Abram is going through here. God says, get up. Leave your people, your land, your country, and I'm going to show you a new place. 
He's also going to leave behind his religion. He's going to leave behind his gods for a new god. And in Joshua 24, uh, it says that Abram worshipped other gods, but we would have known that anyways, because everybody where Abram came from worshipped false gods. So Abram was one of those Tower of Babel guys who worshipped all those false gods, who tried to get what he wanted out of those gods. And God says, I'm going to be your God. And God doesn't say, put away those idols, get rid of those false gods. There's no Ten Commandments. There's no moral code. There's just an offer to walk with the one true God. God says, I've got something for you. And why God chose Abram, we don't know. He just chose him. And so he's going to have to, he's going to, have to trust. He won't be asked to leave anything that God won't replace. You're going to give up your land, I'm going to give you a new land. You're going to give up your people, I'm going to give you new people. And he makes this promise. He says, I'll make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. So you contrast this with Tower of Babel. They wanted to make a name for themselves. God says, I'll make a name for you. I'm going to make you into a nation. And this promise shapes the whole rest of the story of Genesis, actually the whole Bible. God says, I'll bless you. You will be a blessing to others. And he says, I'll bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went, Abram went as the Lord had told him. So to be in covenant with God means God says, if people are good to you, I'll be good to them. And if people are bad to you, I'll be bad to them. God says, I will be for you, Abram. And the result of all this is that the whole world is going to get blessed. Remember, God's plan, if we remember back to Genesis 1 and 2, he's in relationship with all of humanity. He lives in the Garden of Eden with people. And that gets broken in Genesis 3. And the whole story is to getting back to Eden. And this is how God's going to do it. He's going to reveal himself to this man, to this family. But it's not just for Abram. The point is so that all peoples on earth are going to be blessed through you. So, Abram sets out. I don't know what he says to his relatives. One of the gods showed up and said, I'm supposed to go, so I'm going. He leaves. He takes Lot, his nephew, with him, and Sarai. Her name's not Sarah yet. Sarai, and all their wealth, and they go to Canaan, uh, which is about 500 miles away. It's about from here to the Alberta border, Alberta border. And when he finally gets there, I guess God gave him directions along the way. He had to know where to go. He gets where he's going, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. He gets there, and he says, this is it. This is the place that I'm going to give you. And you know what? It's better than what he left. I've never been to northern Syria or to Iraq, but I've seen pictures. Israel looks a whole lot better. He took them out of a dry and dusty land, and yeah, Israel's pretty dry and dusty too, but it's a way better land with way better soil and way better potential for growth and for it to do really well. And so Abram, he gave up his land, and what God gave him was so much better. And I think that's kind of the first takeaway of this story is that this is how God works. When he calls you to leave something behind, he will give you something better. Um, years ago, I was a, a youth pastor in the church where I grew up, just like Scott and Andy, and God called me to leave that place. And he actually used this passage. On one Monday morning, God gave this passage, uh, 12 verse 1, get up from the land you're in and go to the land I will show you. He gave it to Nikki, and about two hours later, he gave the same verse to me, without us connecting. Um, and so we knew. God was saying, it's time to go. And so we left, not knowing where we were going to go. And all we went was 60 miles down the highway uh, to Winkler. But that was a better step. It was a better place for our family. It was a better place for me. Not that that other place wasn't good. This was just even better. And then God did that two more times in my life, where he says, it's time to leave where you are. I've got something better for you. And that's how God works. He calls us to leave sometimes, and he gives us something better. Sometimes it's a habit, something that you're doing in your life that God says, I want you to leave that behind, and he'll give you something better. Sometimes it's a relationship that's not good. I'm walking with a, 
a young man right now, not from our church or even our community, who's in a bad relationship and he knows it. And he's trying to be obedient to God to leave it. And it's hard to trust that God's going to have something better. But this is how God works. You leave what you have, I will give you what I have for you, and it will be better. So Abram gets there to this new land, and he says, wow, this is better. And he builds a couple of altars, and the second one at a place called Bethel. And it says, there he built an altar to Yahweh, and he called on the name of Yahweh. So this is Abram, who used to worship all kinds of false gods. And this is kind of a conversion experience. He says, I'm going to worship Yahweh from now on. And that's kind of the end of the first scene. And then there's a famine. There's always a famine. And they go, he's got to go down to Egypt because there's no food. So they're going to go down to Egypt. So in, in uh, 12, 11, as he was about to enter Egypt, he says to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. That's a good way to start any conversation, guys. <laughs> when the Egyptians see you, and she was 65 years old at this point, just so you know. Um, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they'll let you live. So say you're my sister, so that I'll be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. So he's getting into a, a, a dangerous situation, and he schemes to protect himself. He's worried that he's going to get killed. He's not exactly sure why this would happen in Egypt or whatever, but somehow Abram is competition, and it would be just easy enough to kill him so they could take his wife. So he comes up with a scheme. The thing you need to know is Abram has no idea what it's like to walk with God. He doesn't have to scheme at all. God says, I'm going to build a mighty nation through you. You think God's going to let him get killed? Of course not. But Abram doesn't know that because he doesn't know what God's like yet. He doesn't trust that God will protect him. So he just says, I've got to protect myself. And how often do we do that? Well, God, I don't think you're going to come through for me. I'm not even going to give you a chance, so I'm going to take care of it. I'll take it into my own hands. And so that's what he does. And Sarai, his wife, gets taken. And she becomes the wife of Pharaoh. Um, and so what's Abram's outlook on God's promise at this time? God said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. He's got no kids. Now he doesn't even have a wife. He's not even in the land that he was supposed to be in. He's in Egypt. It's the exact opposite of everything God said was going to happen. But God is still at work. Abram doesn't know it, but God is still at work. The Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. And he sends him away with everything that he had. Remember what God said? If anyone harms you, I will harm them. Pharaoh was harming him by sleeping with Abram's wife. And so God harmed Pharaoh. Was that Pharaoh's fault? Pharaoh didn't even know. But God says, this is how I will work. I will be 100% for you, no matter what. Abram is not the role model in this story. God is the role model. It's a story about God, not a story about Abram. Abram gets it wrong many times. But here's the thing. Even if Abram steers it off course and they're into the ditch, God takes the wheel and says, nope, we get this thing back on the road and we're going to keep on going. And that's exactly what God does here. Abram steers in the ditch. God puts him back on track. God could have dismissed Abram at this point, said, Abram, you idiot, why did you do this? I'll find somebody else. But he doesn't. He said, I'm going to be with you. And so he stays with him. And instead, he blesses him. We'll skip through uh, chapter 13 and 14, but it's all about God blessing Abram. And he gets rich, and he has so much livestock between him and his nephew that they have to separate. There's not even enough land for all the animals that they have. That's how blessed they are. And Lot gets captured. Abram gets about 300 guys, goes to war. He wins the war, gets back Lot and all his wife. He gets blessed by Melchizedek. God is just pouring out his blessing on Abram, just like he said he would. Then we get to chapter 15. After all this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. He reminds Abram of his promised protection. I will look out for you. And his promised reward. Remember what I said. 
And Abram's been just waiting for God to show up because he's got a question just burning on his heart that he's just dying to ask God. And now God shows up, so he asks. And Abram says, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. That's his problem. God, you said, I'm going to be a great nation. How can that be? I don't have any kids. I got a servant. I'm going to have to give all my inheritance to this servant. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And I love this part. God takes him outside and says, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Take a look at the stars. I don't know how many stars you can see with the naked eye. A lot. Probably a lot more back then with no light pollution. And he just stares at these, these stars. And God says, that's how many offspring you're going to have. God says this to an old man with an old wife with no kids. And the amazing thing here is Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is Abram's one shining moment in the story. He believes God without much history to look back on. When I have faith in God, when I trust in God, it's because I look back on my life and I see, oh yeah, God, you've been faithful to me so many times. I look at the life, your lives, and I see, oh yeah, God, you are faithful to them. You are faithful to them. It's easy for me to trust in God. And if that's not enough, I can look at my parents and my grandparents. I can look at all this history and say, wow, God, you've been faithful so many times. And if that's not enough, I can go back through 2,000 years of church history and say, wow, God, you've been faithful. And if that's not enough, I can go to the New Testament. And if that's not enough, I can go to the prophets. I can go all the way back to when God parted the Red Sea. I've got all this history on God to look back on and say, yeah, I should probably put my trust in you. Abram doesn't have any of that. He's the first one in the story. But he believes anyways. And that's his way of saying, okay, God, I'm in. I will believe you. And I'm sure there's a part of Abram that says, this does not make sense. I'm an old man. My wife is an old woman. This is not going to work, but uh, I will believe you. And God credits to him as righteousness. That's God's way of saying, okay, I'm in with you. So he's faithful. He's doing well. God makes the covenant official. Uh, and then this story in chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. They go from faithful to faithless so quickly. God's not coming through, so we got to do this our own way. So they pursue this path. This is not God's path. They've steered off course again. But God's determined to carry out his plan. He will steer them back on course. And we're going to look more at this story um, next week. But God still doesn't give up on Abram. This was not the plan to go and sleep with this woman and have a child with this woman. But God says, no, we're going to put this thing back on track again. Chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and you will greatly increase your numbers. This whole story started when he was 75 years old. He's been waiting for 24 years. You've been waiting for anything for 24 years in your life? Some of you probably have. Ten years? Five years? Maybe you've been waiting for something for 24 months and it feels like 24 years. Sometimes we have to wait. Abram waited 24 years for this promise to come through. If you're waiting, keep waiting. Abram fell face down and God said to me, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, which means father of many nations. For I have made you a father of many nations. God's promise is so big 
it requires a name change. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. So it's about to happen. Get ready. It's coming. And uh, Abraham's way of keeping that covenant is circumcision. Um, Cut that part off of the message, but we'll keep going. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. So this blessing is not going to come through some slave woman. It will come through Sarah. She is now part of this whole thing. Not by anyone else, and she gets a name change as well, which is a little bit less clear than than Abram's name change. So Abram Abraham now fell face down again. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Have you ever laughed at God? Have you ever said, This is impossible? It's one thing to tell a joke and nobody laughs at you. It's a way worse thing to say something that's not supposed to be funny and people laugh. This was not intended to be a joke, what God said. And yet Abraham laughs. Why can't we do this through Ishmael? I've got a son right here. Why can't we do it my way, God? I've got a plan. Why can't we do it my way? I've got it figured out. He doesn't believe God. He laughs at God's idea. God's not mad. God just carries on. Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Abraham must be frustrated at this point. This whole thing is impossible. There's no way it can work. He's 100 years old, his wife is 90, and God will not listen to reason. There's a perfectly good son right here in Ishmael. Why can't we do this through him? And God won't listen. Does God ever not make sense to you? When God doesn't make sense, there's two options. Either you're right and God is wrong, or God is right and you are wrong. So... The creator of the universe, who set the sun and the moon and the stars in place, who knows the number of hairs on your head, who knows every thought that goes inside of you, who knows every person in this world by name, is wrong, and you're right, or it's the other way around. Those are your only options. But for Abraham, he can't see it God's way. This does not make sense. It's impossible. 90-year-old women do not have children. God shows up again, chapter 18, in the form of three visitors. And these three visitors, who are God, ask, Where is your wife Sarah? There in the tent, Abram said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. So now we're getting pretty specific. Within 12 months, this thing is going to happen. I've been waiting for 24 years Within the next year, this is going to happen. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old. We know that already. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing, just by a little bit. She's 90. And not only that, when she was childbearing age, she was barren. She is twice barren by age and by, by her nature. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? She laughs at the idea too. She's 90 years old. Are you kidding me, God? So why has God waited so long? God could have 
called them. Uh, Abraham's 10 years older. Abraham was 30 and Sarah was 20. Why didn't God call them then? Why didn't they have Isaac when she was 20 years old? Could have worked then. God specifically waited till they were 100 and till they were 90 because he wants to reveal himself. He wants to show what kind of God he is. All those other gods that Abraham used to worship, they can't do anything like this. But God says, I want to show you the kind of God I am. So I'm going to wait till it is beyond a shadow of a doubt that this birth will be miraculous. A barren woman who's 90 years old, God is trying to show them what he's like. That's the lesson. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. I like this. God acts confused. Why did, why did Sarah laugh? I wasn't trying to be funny. Why would she laugh? Why, why wouldn't she believe me? And he asked that really good question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? It's a question for us to think about this morning. You've got impossible stuff in your life. Is anything too hard for the Lord? We think about creation. We just went there a few weeks ago. God who set the sun and moon and stars in place, who moved the land and the water around with his hands. Is there stuff in your life that's harder than that? We struggle. We don't believe. We laugh when God says he's going to do something. We act like Sarah. She was afraid. So she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. <laughs> this is back to Garden of Eden. You notice this? It sounds like Adam and Eve at the tree with the serpent. They're lying. They're afraid. They don't trust God. They don't believe God. It's Garden of Eden all over again. But God doesn't give up. Sarah just laughed at God and then lied to God. <laughs> If that was us, we would say, sorry, Sarah, you had your chance. There's lots of other ladies out here that I can work with. That's what I would have done. That's what you would have done. But God is not like people. That's the Tower of Babel where we create gods in our image. We think God is like us. God is not like us. She doesn't believe. She laughs. She lies. And this is how God responds. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah. Isn't that amazing? As he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. She was unbelieving. She laughed. She lied. And God was gracious. <laughs> this is the first use of gracious in the whole Bible. Todd read this morning, from Psalm 103, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, bounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is the first time in the whole Bible that God shows us what it means to be gracious. Do Abraham and Sarah deserve God's grace? Not at all. That's why it's grace. And I love this response from Sarah, who just laughed at God a year ago. Now she's got this baby in her arms. And she says, God has brought me laughter. And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. A new kind of laughter. God will do whatever God wants to do. Nothing will get in his way, even the very people he chose to work with. Even though they scheme, even though they don't trust, even though they laugh at God, God is gracious. And I think when we meet that God, we laugh with joy along with Sarah. So this improbable story of a woman who should never have had a child for obvious physical reasons reminds us of another woman, Mary, who should never have had a child for obvious physical reasons. One is 90 years old and the other is a teenage virgin. But these are small obstacles for God. 
The story of God and his people begins with an impossible birth story. And the story of Jesus begins with an impossible birth story. The connection is intentional. It's not a coincidence. Because Jesus is the one who's going to fulfill this story. The promise made to Abraham that he would be a blessing to the whole world couldn't be fulfilled until the final piece of the puzzle was in place. And that piece was Jesus. The gracious gift of salvation that he offers. Remember when Sarah laughed at God because she didn't believe that God could do what God said he could do. How did God respond? He was gracious. When Jesus came and brought his kingdom to the world and ultimately went to the cross, gave us victory over sin and death, this was God's way of being gracious to the whole world. Remember, he said every nation in the world will be blessed. That comes through Jesus. He's the final step in God's plan to bless the world. So I want you again just to consider the impossible things in your life this morning. Probably doesn't take too long for us to think of a few things that seem pretty impossible. A diagnosis that can't be cured, uh, a relationship that's impossible to heal, a financial obstacle that just can't be overcome. And ask that same question that God asks, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is what you're facing, is that just too much for God? Is that just, it's just too big? Is there anything too hard for Jesus? Can you show me anywhere in the Gospels where Jesus comes up against a situation and Jesus says, well, that's just beyond me. I, I can't handle that one. No, they're not in there. There's nothing too hard for our Lord. There is nothing too hard for Jesus. This week I was reminded of the story uh, of Johnny Erickson Tata. And a number of you will know that name, but probably a number of you don't. Um, when Johnny... Uh, it's a girl, or J-O-N-I. When she was 17 years old, uh, in 1967, she dove into a lake that was more shallow than she thought. And she hit her head and she broke her neck. And she became a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the shoulders down. And she prayed for that miraculous healing. Lots of people came around her and said, pray that God will heal you, you will get out of this wheelchair. And she struggled. She had a real faith struggle between a faith in a God who could heal her and faith in a God who would heal her. And those are not the same thing. And that miracle did not come. And however many years later, she's in her 70s now, uh, she's still in that wheelchair. But a different miracle came. She learned how to paint using just her mouth, putting a paintbrush in her mouth. And she became a world-famous painter. She authored uh, 25 books, translated into 33 different languages. She became an international speaker and evangelist all over the world. Her radio program is on 800 stations a, we a week. She's impacted the lives of millions. God did a miracle, a totally different one than she was looking for. And if you would ask her, what's a bigger miracle, that God would heal your neck and you could walk, or that you could impact the lives of millions and thousands would come to know Jesus because of your ministry, she would say, that second one's a way bigger miracle. So we take whatever is impossible in our life and we bring that to the Lord. We bring that to Jesus and we say, this is impossible, but nothing's impossible for you. So would you do what you want to do with this situation? It might be exactly what I want. Or it might be something that I did not see coming at all. If he can bring pregnancy to a 90-year-old woman and to a teenage virgin, virgin, and if he can do what he did in Johnny Erickson Tata's life, he can do the impossible in our lives as well. So my invitation this morning is to bring our impossible to a gracious God who gives us far more than we deserve. Let's pray. God, you are the God of impossible. So often we think of you as small or limited somehow. We think of our circumstances as bigger than what you can do. And we confess that. We ask for your forgiveness for seeing our stuff without you in the picture. 
And so, Lord, we bring our stuff to you right now. These situations that come to mind that seem absolutely impossible. Would we have the faith to believe like Abraham did? To trust that you are who you say you are. That you will be faithful in all of this, Lord. That you will do miracles. That you will do what you want to do. So we thank you for a good God that you are. We thank you for your faithfulness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.